So, Mega Minds 2 is probably the most baffling film I have probably ever seen ever. I truly don't understand what happened to my boy. Not only are the writers the exact same and they still somehow produce this abomination, this film was released within the same week of Kung Fu Panda 4, meaning that any attention Megamind 2 got is just going to be completely forgotten and ignored for what will probably be a significantly superior film. I don't know, I haven't watched it yet. Who on earth plans that? Who at DreamWorks was like, yo, we have a sequel for this beloved film that everyone universally loves. Let's just release it. Mmm here. But sir, isn't that literally a week before one of our biggest films of the year? Won't that completely overshadow the release of Megamind 2? Sorry, did someone say something? I just... <sighs> I was talking with a friend of mine about this and we were both going bonkers over the very questionable marketing and release decisions for this thing. I just don't understand this at all. But you're not here for the business side of things. You want to hear me complain about the writing and explain why it's bad. So let's dive right into that. The writing is bad. Surprise, surprise. I think everyone can agree that the overall story and writing of Mega Man 2 is terrible, especially in regards to performing as a follow-up to the brilliant and introspective story of its predecessor. But to me, there are really five main areas where the writing really falls apart. I'm not going to explain each one because I want to dive into other things in this video, but the weakest and most infuriating aspects of the writing in this movie really drops the ball on include the following. The comedy, the emotional beats, the tone, the characterizations of both returning and brand new characters, and the overall messages and themes Megamind 2 attempts to tackle throughout its runtime. For the purposes of this video, I'm only going to focus on these three because those are going to be the most important in my rewrite as well as a quick analysis of how Megamind 2 performs the studio as a sequel. Actually, you know what? That's a great place to start. How well does Megamind 2 fulfill its duty as a sequel to the original classic? Spoilers for Megamind, by the way. And Megamind 2, I don't know if you really care about that one, but, but spoilers for that one as well. You know. When we left off our beloved blue-headed Will Ferrell, he had just saved the city from Titan, got the girl of his dreams, and was recognized as the protector and defender of Metro City. Solid stuff. His relationship with Roxanne was going well, with a nice kiss at the end of the film. Megamind and Minion were total bros and, be and just back to being best buddies, and Megamind was excited to finally live up to who he was as a good guy, using his throbbing cranium of science to protect and defend Metro City from, uh, I don't know, bears? So the first film ends well, and every plotline is satisfied and the audience is happy with the story they got. But then comes Megamind 2, with a promise to continue the blue genius's adventure to new heights. Where does Megamind go next on his grand journey? Well, the movie begins with three fish dudes breaking into a fish place to steal a fish to sell on the black like fish market, market, only two days after Megamind was inaugurated as the city's hero. Weird villains, and I'm not really sure how they quite fit into the adult feel of the first film, but uh, okay. And then we get to what is quite possibly the most infuriating change this sequel made throughout its entire hour and a half runtime. Megamind gave me a new name. Old Chum. Why did you change Minion's name? Who decided this? Who thought this was a good idea? Who looked perfection in the face and decided that it needed to be changed? This was easily the most senseless alteration from the original movie and it still makes me mad. You should feel ashamed of yourself, DreamWorks. <clears throat> Moving on. Megamind is being an annoying self-centered egotist and not in the fun way like Bully Maguire. Roxanne Ritchie is still being the news person, but she's unsatisfied with just talking about other people's successes, which we'll get into later, don't worry. There's this new character who impresses Roxanne with her half million followers on Vine, even though she's five, and Minion, or, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Chum, is voiced by someone who just sounds bored all the time, which honestly, I don't blame the poor guy for being forced to deal with this script. Everything is going just fine until, uh-oh, the evil bad guys are watching Megamind be a good guy on screen and they break out of prison to give him a good talking to. It just occurred to me how weird it is that these villains are not wearing prisoner clothing. They're just in their villain outfits and never changed throughout the entire movie. They literally, that literally did not bother me until writing the script. I guess the character model designer people didn't have the time necessary to model the Doom Syndicate in prison outfits. Weird. Anyways, they break into Megamind's house and reveal that they were part of the Doom Syndicate and Megamind was their glorious leader. As many people have already pointed out, this absolutely breaks the continuity established by the first film. Megamind's entire story revolved around him feeling alone and empty, purposeless, unhappy. Melancholy. Until Roxanne gave him the connection he desperately needed. Minion is a fantastic fish friend, but it's thanks to the influence of Roxanne that Megamind truly fulfills what he's always wanted. To be a good person and to be loved for who he is. He needs this kind of connection because he can't 
get it really anywhere else. But then Megamind 2 came along and said, hey, you remember the super villain friends that didn't exist? Well, guess who's back? This fact alone would be enough to break continuity so hard that it would be on the same level of bad sequels as Cars 2. But trust me, it gets worse. Megamind and Roxanne's stellar romance they spent an entire movie building up kind of just gets completely forgotten. Anytime anyone points out that there's romantic tension between the two of them, they just blankly stare at whoever said that and respond with, It's, it's complicated. complicated. Why? Why is it complicated? She kissed Megamind at the end of the last movie. Why is it all of a sudden complicated now? Is there a line of dialogue to explain what happened in the last two days that we haven't seen these characters like they did in Thor Ragnarok? No. Let Roxanne and Megamind kiss, you cowards. Why did you change the most important and impactful relationship that basically built up the entire plot and emotional ness of the last movie why did you mess this how could how could you mess this up so bad megamind and minion despite being well established as a fantastic superhero duo that work incredibly well together fighting crime are now degraded to i want to be your sidekick and be appreciated more uh, cool i guess but i thought they were already basically sidekicks by the end of the first movie they have this entire b storyline that pretty much shafts minion out of the movie for the vast majority of its runtime in order to have some funny moments where megamind is struggling to use a toaster it honestly felt like the writers weren't sure what they were going to do with minion in this movie and it shows anyways that's pretty much all i wanted to talk about to get you guys up to speed on the new movie megamind gets depressed because he can't single-handedly take on the doom syndicate even though he basically does exactly that a few scenes later minion and megamind reunite and become best buddies again. Roxanne and Megamind's relationship doesn't change at all from being it's complicated. Megamind is stalked by a five-year-old. Seriously, this is straight up an important plot point that should have been really gross, but it just kind of gloss over and forgotten about, and this is like everything else in this movie. Roxanne becomes the mayor, which was kind of built up throughout the film. I'll give him that. Megamind gets his own bat signal, even though he already did in a short they made 13 years ago. Set up cliffhanger for TV show, roll credits, and we're finally done with this thing. So... Does Megamind 2 fulfill its duties as a sequel to Megamind 1? Hmm. What Megamind 1 had established with this incredibly introspective and powerfully emotional story, Megamind 2 either retcons out of existence or just kind of forgets about. The important relationships that made Megamind into the character and hero by the end of the first film are shafted so drastically they look almost unrecognizable. Megamind's well-established genius and creativity is coddled in favor of the movie trying to be funny, and the entire plot of Megamind's character arc is basically written out of existence by the simple fact that the Doom Syndicate exists. So is Megamind 2 a good sequel by sequel standards? Uh, no, absolutely not. But the crazy thing is it totally could have been. Tweak a few things here and there and keep in mind the beautiful story established 14 years ago and Megamind 2 has the potential to be a culturally defining film that more than lives up to its original. I'm saying that because I see a lot of potential in the sequel, not that just that my proposed solutions are going to accomplish exactly that. But before I go into my rewrite, I want to talk about some of the specific writing flaws in Megamind 2 that I feel really need to be addressed. The specific issues I had with Megamind 2 mostly derived from how the film handled its emotional moments, the characterization of the new and returning cast of colorful faces, and the movie's attempts to dive into legitimately compelling themes. If you count through the film's entire hour and a half runtime, it has one potentially emotional moment. Dang, and the first movie had, what, 11 teen or something? The singular serious scene revolves around Megamind being depressed because he can't face down the entire Doom Syndicate by himself, and thus the whole city is doomed because he can't be the hero everyone needs him to be, even though he basically single-handedly takes down all four members of the Doom Syndicate later, but you know, whatever, character development, I guess. I Roxanne and Twitch streamer need to go find our poor hero by stalking his location through a tracker the five-year-old put in a pin, which I'm still not over how weird and invasive that is, but the movie treats it as totally fine because it's done by a child, but whatever. This is a real problem happening to real celebrities, and the movie totally brushes it aside and pretends that it's totally normal to stalk your favorite famous person. That's not okay. Anyways, they find Megamind hanging out in a pile of trash, wearing a fake beard to conceal his identity. Dude, you literally have a watch that can shapeshift you into other people. Where was that? Roxanne and YouTube girl walk up to him and they're like, why are you sad? And Megamind just goes, you know the hero thing and how I basically fought Superman and won? Well, I can't take on four X-Men with drastically weaker powers, so I'm just going to hang out in the trash until I die. Then Roxanne says, that's dumb. You're dumb. Dumb. And then the local TikTok celebrity rehashes the plot of the first movie, getting Megamind all hyped up to go do the thing. And then Megamind shows up out of nowhere and is all, hey, I exist and am now relevant to the plot. Let's go do the thing. And so they go do the thing. That was admittedly a terrible retelling of the scene, but I think you get the gist. The emotional moment doesn't really work for several different reasons. For one, it's a huge tonal shift from the rest of the film that feels pretty drastic from the kids cartoon the audience has been watching for the whole hour before this scene. So there is that. Secondly, while this does line up sort of with what Megamind has been established, 
person in the sense that after expending all resources he could think of in the moment, he's not super confident in himself until he gets another idea. But in this case, in this specific story, he tried one thing and it didn't work. In Megamind 1, he fought Titan with his giant mech suit and lost, and then tried to ball his opponent up in a giant copper cage. When that didn't work, that's when he went to Roxanne for help and found Metro Man, but Metro Man didn't want to help because he was retired, so he tried to motivate Megamind to be the hero instead with Roxanne continuing the encouragement. But Megamind was too far into his self-doubt and has internalized the city's branding of him being a villain, so he gives up. It's only after expending pretty much all of his other options that he actually gives up, and the story took a long and painful road to get there. In Megamind 2, he tries one thing, doesn't work, trash depression. It does not feel consistent with what Megamind has been through for him to give up this quickly. Give the man at least a couple more scenes where he tries different ideas and keeps getting blown back every time please. Finally, the emotional impact of this scene almost completely relies on the local Facebook content creator to reinvigorate the hero to live up to his duty and potential. She brings an interesting theme into play in this scene, which admittedly is a little heartwarming. Because of Megamind's example as a hero, he inspired her to fully embrace who she was and to do her best to be a good influence in the world around her. However, this touching moment does suffer from the bad writing of the vlogger herself. She's just not that interesting or entertaining. Her enthusiasm for Megamind's heroics mostly comes off as annoying and her weird sense of entitlement for his attention and to be part of his team just feels kind of gross. She also outsmarts him and solves his problem for him, which I find to be really infuriating on a personal level. And she put a tracker on him so that she could stalk him for Instagram views. What on earth is wrong with you, infant child? She completely fills the role of annoying sidekick character and not in an entertaining or interesting way. This is the one scene where she brings something meaningful to the table, but it's just let down thanks to the fact that she's not that great of a person and a poorly written character. If the Snapchat influencer was actually a likable character, this would be a really touching scene. But seeing as everything she does just comes off as weirdly entitled and completely upstaging the main character, this moment just falls flat so hard. I already kind of talked about my problems with the characterization of this film in my recap, so I think I'm honestly just going to skip this one. All you really need to know is that the characters are written poorly and uninteresting and the continuity of the first film set up in terms of Megamind's relationships and genius is frustratingly broken and shambles in the sequel. Anyway, let's talk theme. Throughout the runtime of the film, three major themes show up but are unfortunately never fully expanded upon. They include Megamind being forced to deal with the shadows of his past life, Roxanne and Minion being unsatisfied with their work compared to the notoriety and attention Megamind is getting as the new hero of Metro City, an online commentator girl being inspired to rise above societal expectations and be the good person she always wanted to be. The movie doesn't really take the necessary time to really explore these different ideas and tell a unique story about them. They kind of just show up and are mentioned a little before being almost completely forgotten about until they need to show up again because, you know, plot. One of the things I was most looking forward to was how Megamind was going to handle seeing his old friends from a life he wants to move on from. I wanted to see how my hero was going to deal with that challenging conversation of we can't be friends anymore. How did the movie approach this encounter? Megamind traps them in a cage and makes bad jokes about how he's better than them and then they break out and beat him up. That confrontation is never really addressed and the movie doesn't take the time to go into the minds of the villains and how they feel about losing their friend. Something so serious and potentially groundbreaking is handled with the same level of intellectual storytelling one would find in a children's TV show, which is a massive disappointment because everyone knows how capable DreamWorks is at tackling big, introspective, and potentially life-changing concepts in their stories. That's something this company is good at, and they're not afraid to push expectations or try something different to accomplish such a story. While the poor characterizations and the terrible job Megamind 2 did at following up the story of the first is the most frustrating aspects of this movie, the biggest disappointment is simply the clear disregard of the great potential this film had to explore interesting and potentially life-changing ideas. I want to see that story on screen, but it seems the writers were too rushed to make that a reality. So you know what? Fine. I'll do it myself. I want to uncover the great story Megamind 2 could have been. So here is my attempt at rewriting the sequel and make it something hopefully good and enjoyable. This is mostly for my own well-being, but if you enjoy or have thoughts on what I came up with, let me know in the comments below. But without any further ado, let's dive into my rewrite for Megamind 2, Megamind vs. The Sins of the Past. I couldn't really come up with a cool title. Um, I guess, well, eh, I'm going completely off script here, but uh, let's call this one Megamind 2, Megamind, excuse me? Let's call this one Megamind versus Igor Lavushka. 
The film opens with a similar heist. Three low-life criminals are planning on robbing a bank. This isn't three fish dudes, but instead just some standard criminals, you know? They break into the bank and try to take the money, but they stop when, all of the sudden, at Megamind's and Minion, the heroes of Metro City show up to stop their fiendish scheme. Much of the surprise of the heroes, however, these seemingly ordinary criminals whip out sci-fi technology that looks all too familiar. They are the same weapons Megamind has used in the past. Following a quick action sequence, Megamind and Minion finally take down these criminals. Megamind asks them where they got their powers. Where they got their powers? <laughs> Megamind asks them where they got their weapons, and they reveal that in the aftermath of Megamind's throwing in the towel as Metro City's number one villain, people started finding, stealing, and selling Megamind technology to whoever they thought was worth their socks in crime and theft. These are just normal criminals, but with the genius and dangerous technology of Megamind behind them, they have become something more. They have truly become villains worthy of a hero to face down and defeat. The following scene features a press conference where the delegates of Metro City are discussing how to put their city back together and what to do with Megamind. Between Megamind's anarchistic rule of the city, as well as him being responsible for the creation of Titan, who destroyed most of Metro City, Megamind does not have the full support of everyone. Our hero tries to reassure everyone that he has changed and wants to be an influence for good, but the city council is split on whether or not to fully trust this guy. Roxanne gives her remarks for why the leadership of Metro City should support Megamind, and the mayor adds his words of encouragement and loyalty to the blue-headed hero, adding in, I hope the city can recognize the heroic actions of this man. I don't have much time left as mayor, so I want to guarantee that the city's safety and well-being can rest in the hands of Megamind himself. After the conference, a little girl named Kiko comes up to Megamind and asks if she can take a picture with her hero. Megamind is flattered, but before the two can really get to know each other, an explosion goes off and Megamind must fill his heroic duties and investigate. He and Minion join with the police in the skirmish and they save the day once again. However, during the battle, Minion finds it challenging to be effective on the city's battlefield with his clunky suit. After everything wraps up, he asks Megamind if the genius can make some upgrades to Minion's suit. Megamind simply tells Minion that he'll get working on that as soon as the two have room to breathe. After the scuffle, Megamind and Minion reunite with Roxanne in the lair. Roxanne is struggling inside herself with the desire to help Megamind fight crime in a more proactive way. She wants to be an active force, driving the public and city councils to support her boyfriend. While reflecting on this, Minion casually remarks that elections for mayor are coming up and suggests that Roxanne should go for it. Megamind agrees and encourages her to take the opportunity to campaign. As a quick side note, I loved the idea behind Roxanne wanting to do more and then getting elected mayor. I think it makes a lot of sense. I just think that something like that should have been more prominent throughout the story in order to be more effective. Now, with the rewrite, Roxanne has a clear goal she is working towards within the first act. But wait, it seems something might stand in the way of her goal of getting elected as mayor and Megamind's goal of proving himself to the city that he is worthy of the title hero. Meanwhile, at the prison, we get a quick look as to how Hal is doing. The former villain known as Titan is nowhere near the level of evil presence he once commanded. The rest of the prisoners pick on Hal for being so pathetic and he often lashes out angrily at snide remarks from his fellow inmates. While eating lunch, a bomb goes off somewhere in the prison and each of the guards rush to the source. Wondering what could be going on, the walls of the cafeteria blow open to reveal Igor Lavushka, the cunning and manipulative leader who has risen up to control and commands the crime in Metro City. Igor and his cronies fight the prison guards and free the inmates. Hal wants to go with them and escape, but Igor throws him in a cell. Looking down on the former supervillain, Igor explains to Hal, We have no more room for cowards and pathetic children in Metro City. You were once someone. You once had a name. But now you are nothing but the burning embers of a childish passion. Hal is terrified, and Igor leaves him shaking in his own prison cell. It felt really odd to have all of these comic book-esque supervillains when it was established in the first film that Megamind and Metro Man were really the only super individuals. In order for Megamind to find a new hero, he literally had to make one with the powers of science. So in this story, Igor Lavushka will play the role of the powerful antagonist for Megamind to defeat, but he has no real powers of his own other than his cunning and manipulative leadership. Igor was once a part of Megamind's prison family, not necessarily some kind of villain justice league, but a group of evil criminals within Metro City who knew each other and, while they were in prison before Megamind got his own cell, basically acted as a kind of family to each other. No one was more furious than Igor when Megamind decided to turn 
good. The next scene features the beginning of Roxanne's campaign to be mayor. She gets ready to go up to the crowd and deliver her speech. However, as she is about to address the city, Igor and the criminals he freed from the prison take control of the conference. Igor walks up to the microphone and shares why Metro City should not support Megamind, but should instead support Igor. Megamind left his own life. Why would anyone think that he was going to stay good? Megamind has destroyed the city, killed Metro Man, and created Titan. Addressing the crowd, Igor asks, How could anyone give their support to such a man-child, not knowing what kind of insane trouble he has planned for this city? Both Roxanne and Kiko, as well as some other individuals in the audience, begin defending Megamind's role as a hero. Igor gives the ominous warning that unless the city gives him their full support, they will not be free. While Igor is making his address to the city, Megamind is heading to the prison to answer the call about the prison break-in. While he and Minion are on their way to the prison, they get ambushed by some of Megamind's former family members from the prison. I just realized I wrote down prison like five times in two sentences. Oh, geez. Due to the fact that they are unprepared, Minion being unable to contribute much due to his clunky body, and the former prisoners using several of his special weapons, Megamind and Minion both get totally overpowered. The criminals don't kill or capture Megamind and Minion, but instead simply relay a message from Megamind's old friend, Igor. Megamind needs to join his former prison family, or else Igor will take over the city and throw Megamind in his own special cell once again for the rest of his life with no hope of ever escaping. After Roxanne, Megamind, Minion, and Kiko reunite, they need to come up with a plan of how to stop Igor. They head back to Megamind's hideout to get things in order to take on Igor, but when they arrive, something is not right. Out from behind the hideout, Megamind's old spider bot, now piloted by one of Igor's cronies, rush up to the gang and nab Roxanne, Minion, and Kiko. Megamind speaks into the speaker. That was actually the set. Okay. <clears throat> Megamind speaks into the camera and microphone demanding that Igor release his friends, but Igor blackmails the hero instead. If Megamind wants his friends free, he will have to enter into the lair alone without any weapons of any kind. Megamind obliges, and Igor gives the order to set Roxanne, Minion, and Kiko free. Igor then approaches Megamind and tells him that he is only interested in talking right now. Igor tells the hero that he has the power to change the city and make it better, but also the capacity to annihilate the entirety of Metro City and everyone inside. Whatever happens is completely dependent on whether or not Megamind chooses to release his old life in favor of returning to his prison family. With a sad look in his eyes, Megamind simply responds with, I'm sorry, Igor. That life is behind me now. I want to be the defender and hero of Metro City. I want to do good. I want to be good. I want to leave behind my old villainous ways and become something more. So, I'm sorry. I can't go back to the old ways. Take it or leave it, Igor. The villain simply looks at Megamind with disdain and disapproval. After a moment, he simply responds with, You have made a terrible mistake, Megamind. In a flash, the big battle suit steps out from the shadows and grabs the hero. Shocked, Megamind looks down to see Igor in control of the powerful machine. Igor then tells Megamind, You want to leave your old life behind? Fine. Then you will leave it behind in your watery grave. With one quick motion, Igor commands the mech suit to throw Megamind out the window of the hideout and into the ocean, never to be seen again. My greatest disappointment from the sequel is the fact that there was never a scene where Megamind confronts his past friends and says that he wants something different out of life. It would have been so interesting for the different characters to respond in their own unique way, and I think making the villain of the story refuse to forgive Megamind and understand that he wants something different out of life could be all the more vile and repulsive. The classic friends turned enemies, but instead of one becoming evil, one becomes good, and the other just refuses to progress and learn. That would have been the kind of dynamic that could have made Megamind 2 way better than it turned out to be and would have been a powerful powerful moment if the film had committed to that theme of leaving the old life behind and how challenging a transition like that could be. So that's my proposal on how to make that kind of moment effective. Now we get to dive into my proposal of how to improve the other big inspirational scene thing. Uh, let's let's get into it. Tracking Megamind's location thanks to his watch, Minion, Roxanne, and Kiko finds the blue-headed hero floating in the water. They save him and, after he finally awakes, catch him up on what's going on. Igor has essentially taken control of the city and now they are on the run. Megamind, without access to any of his technology and weapons, is all out of options. Not being able to provide much, Kiko simply shares her experience growing up. She was a bit of a rebel and didn't like to conform to what everyone else was doing, and thus the other kids and even teachers shunned her for being too weird and too much trouble. She 
resented the world around her because nothing was going the way that she wanted it to. But after Megamind saved the city, she was inspired to try and make a life of her own. She wanted to be good and make a positive impact on the world. She just never felt like she could because she kept getting outcasted. But Megamind gave her the inspiration to continue forward. She grabs his hand and earnestly tells him, It's because of you that I want to do better. You have inspired me and so many other kids who just feel like they can't do enough because they aren't the popular ones. But you showed the world that it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from. You can choose to be good. That's the Megamind I know. And whether or not you believe it, you can save the day again. I know you can. Megamind, now with confidence, states that he is up for the challenge. But there's still the issue of trying to get supplies to fight back against Igor. Roxanne then smiles and tells him that the city is on Megamind's side. And he no longer has to rely on his own resources. Megamind smiles, turns to Minion, and says, Get back in touch with the outlet store in Romania. Tell them we have a bulk order. In the heart of the city, Igor rules over Metro City like a king, doing whatever he wants and forcing the city to pay up for his demands. Then, he hears it. A pop culture song signaling Megamind's return! Igor unites his forces and goes to battle against Megamind and his new and improved battalions. Minion has a new suit built for crime fighting. Roxanne, Kiko, and the entire police force of Metro City are all decked out in new and improved Megamind technology. The battle ends with a showdown between Megamind and his crazy toys, and Igor in the giant battle suit. The fight takes place on the steps of Megamind's own museum, which Igor has repurposed to be a museum of slander against the hero, to remind the city why they should hate Megamind. At the end of the battle, Megamind and Igor have a quick conversation. Megamind is expressing how much more fulfilling it is to live a life as a hero and how Igor could do the same. But Megamind's old friend is having none of it. He whips out Megamind's own dehydration gun, points it at the hero, and pulls the trigger. Thinking quickly, Megamind grabs a piece of metal and redirects the beam right back at Igor dehydrating the villain instead. In the aftermath, Roxanne is elected mayor of Metro City and they begin the cleanup work to rebuild. Megamind gets all his stuff back and begins working directly with the police force of Metro City to protect his new friends and family. A small number of people from Megamind's previous prison family defect and begin helping him out thanks to the inspirational journey of Megamind. End with epic dance battle and roll credits! So. Yeah, that's the story, I guess. Let me know what you guys think. I wanted to really get into the whole idea that Megamind really is leaving an old family behind. The people at the prison were the very same people that raised him, and I think if DreamWorks wanted to tell that kind of story of a newfound hero facing his ugly past, why not take inspiration from the canon itself? Anyways, I think I've talked this film to death about now, and I don't really have much more to say. I love Megaminds and I want to see it go to some incredible places because I know it can do that. It already has. The first film was something amazing and special and I knew that a sequel had the potential to be just as insane if not more. Jumerix has a very good track record when it came to sequels but I guess for this one they just didn't put in the effort necessary to make it what it needed to be. Admittedly disappointed and kind of frustrated, I kind of just came up with my own story. Not necessarily my own headcanon, but because I knew that there was something that could have been there. But let me know, yeah, let, uh, I'm, I've been going off script here for like a whole 45 seconds, but I hope you enjoyed the rewrite and let me know what you guys think. It was a lot of fun to make and I thoroughly enjoyed trying to <laughs> to make everything work. Anyways, I hope you have an awesome day and I will see you next time. Maybe whenever that is. I don't know when the next video is coming out. We'll see, uh, see you later.